So in this video, we're going to derive and then demonstrate the diffraction pattern that we get when light passes through two narrow slits. Now, historically, this is often called Young's double slit experiment, and it's used as the proof that light really is a wave. Somewhat ironically, there is absolutely no evidence that Young himself ever performed this experiment, but nevertheless, it is an excellent demonstration that light is a wave, and that's probably why his name got attached to it. Now, in the classical Young's double slit experiment, rather than a laser, uh, what was used in the past was a normal source for uh, incandescent light bulb or compact fluorescent, any incoherent source of light, and then that light was passed through a single slit, and that single slit then generated a coherent source that then passed through the two double slits. So often you will see Young's double slit experiment explained as first a single slit and then two slits. However, if we use a modern light source such as a laser, it's automatically a coherent light source and there's no need for this initial single slit and so we can just shine it straight on to our two narrow slits and it will generate a diffraction pattern. So before we go and have a look at the diffraction pattern we get, let's first calculate it so we know what to expect. Now here we have two slits, each of which is narrow. So we're going to assume that the narrowness of the slit means we can treat this as a point source, essentially. So essentially we've got two point sources, and if we're looking at an angle theta away from the normal, then the distance that this ray travels, again assuming that the screen is a long way in this direction, so we're doing this Fraunhofer diffraction, then this ray here travels an extra distance of d sine theta, and so we're going to have a phase difference between the two waves of k, which is the wave number, times d sine theta. So that will give us a phase difference between the two waves. However, what we do typically when we're calculating diffraction patterns is we take the central wave and we use that as the sort of reference point. So when I write down our wave here, uh, our amplitude, it's going to be A times the cosine, and then I've got Kr minus omega t um, minus uh, delta phi over 2 plus, and then I've got the same amplitude A, and then again times the cosine of Kr um, minus omega t, and now plus delta phi over 2. So essentially I'm taking this phase difference between them, and I'm saying I'm adding half of the phase difference, this, you know, it's going to be half a phase difference uh, uh, behind for this ray, and this ray will be uh, half a phase difference uh, ahead. Now, we've got a trig identity to add two cosines together. If you remember, we've seen this before. The cosine of alpha plus the cosine of beta is equal to 2 times the cosine of alpha plus beta over 2 um, times the cosine of alpha minus beta over 2. And we did this for beats and also when we were dealing with dispersion. So here, I'm going to call this alpha, and this is going to be beta. And so when we put these together, what I'm going to end up with for the amplitude is that psi is going to be equal to 2 times A times the cosine. Well, the average of these two is just going to be, of course, Kr minus omega t. And the um, half the difference between the two, well the difference between the two is delta psi, because we've got delta phi, sorry, delta phi over 2 minus minus delta phi over 2, so the difference between them is delta phi, and then we divide that by 2, so this is cosine of delta phi over 2. So let's uh, have a look and see what that's going to look like, but to do that we're going to have to expand out this term here. So here is the amplitude function that I uh, wrote out before, but now I've expanded this term here, because remember that we had a delta half a delta phi, and delta phi is just k times d sine uh, theta, so there's k times the path length difference, and then of course a half because it was delta phi over 2. So I've expand this out uh, further, then I get 2a 
cosine uh, kr minus omega t. But now I can write the k as uh, 2 pi over lambda, so it's multiplied by a half. So I end up with pi d over lambda times the sine of theta. So my question is now is when I plot the amplitude psi versus sine theta, where am I going to get a maximum? Well, I will get a maximum here when the cosine term is either plus or minus 1, right? So this will give us a maximum at plus or minus 1 because remember what we see is the intensity which is proportional to the amplitude squared, so proportional to psi squared here. So as long as this is plus or minus 1, I'll get a maximum. So when is it going to give me uh, a plus or minus 1? Well, it's going to be e when this argument here for the cosine is equal to an integer number of pi. So I've now got the condition for a maximum that pi times d over lambda times sine theta must equal some integer number of pi. Um, and so I can cancel the pi on both sides, and what I get is I will get a maximum in the pattern when sine theta is equal to n lambda over d, where n is equal to now 0 is allowed, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and so on and so forth. Now the other thing to remember before we do the plot is that here the amplitude is equal to the cosine of a function of sine theta. So we're no longer going to have this central maximum, we're going to have oscillations um, because we have this cosine term. And the amplitude, because it's a square, so the intensity, because it's square, the amplitude squared, is going to be proportional to cosine squared. So we're going to have a very different pattern. So let's look at that. So here we have a plot of the amplitude psi, which I've written out here again, versus the uh, sine uh, th as a function of sine theta. And so this green line here shows you the uh, amplitude psi. And the blue line here is the intensity, which of course is proportional to psi squared. So features to note are that at zero here we have a maximum in the intensity and that's because we're equally distant from both slits at this point and so we get constructive interference. The other thing to note is that the slits are evenly spaced so we get we don't get this extra wide one in the middle like we had for the single slit we have equal widths. Um, we have equal widths of uh, fringes, as we call them, uh, are all equally spaced, and so uh, the peak of this fringe, of course, occurs at lambda over d. This one is at two lambda over d. Uh, this one here is at uh, three lambda over d, and of course we have the ones here at minus lambda um, over d, and so on as we go in this direction. So they're all equally spaced, and of course we could easily come up with an argument for uh, an expression for the zeros, which lie halfway in between the maximum points, um, with this central one here being at zero. So of course the minima here is going to be at, uh, or the dark fringe will be at lambda over 2d, and so on as we go out. So that's the double slit, double narrow slit pattern. Let's see if that's what we observe. So now we have the same setup again. We've got our laser, which is our coherent light source. We have two narrow slits uh, in front of it, and we've got the pattern projecting onto the screen. And just as we predicted from the maths, what we're observing here is a series of equally spaced bright and dark fringes. So now we've derived the pattern for two narrow slits, and we've observed that that's exactly what we get when we shine a laser onto two narrow slits. We get the diffraction pattern we expected. Now, this pattern also not only demonstrates that light's a wave, but it also shows how we can use diffraction to analyze light. We see or saw that the separation of these fringes depends on the wavelength of the light, and so if we have two slits with a known separation, we can shine light with an unknown wavelength on it and we could measure the wavelength of light by looking at the separation of the fringes. Now, unfortunately, two slits like this doesn't generate a particularly useful pattern if you're generating, if you're shining on it, some mixture of different wavelengths, for example, such as light from a distant star or even, in fact, light from our sun.
However, if we expand this out, and instead of just having two narrow slits, we have an infinite series of narrow slits, we end up with a piece of uh, uh, apparatus that's called a diffraction grating, and that is in fact an extremely useful mechanism for analyzing the spectra of um, either distant stars, the sun, or in fact your heated elements. You can use it for analyzing any spectrum of light because with a diffraction grating you get a single line for every single different wavelength and so it's easy to separate them out and see the individual wavelengths of light. So that's it for our discussion of diffraction of light.